Ain't no way in hell, Avis, I would accept that bullshit apology. <laughs> Me neither. He's bigger than all of us. I'm just going to put it right on out there. Uh, but he, here is the thing that's interesting to me about that observation from that person. Um, a couple of things that I think is important that people understand. Um, it's been estimated that some 43% of the white students on Harvard's campus got there through legacy admissions. Yep. So let's just put that out on front street, okay? Uh, in terms of the percentage of black students on Harvard's campus writ large, they hit a record number this year of a whopping 15%, okay? And one is, even if one were to say 100% of them were admitted via affirmative action, which, by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with affirmative action. That's the least that we can get, given all that we've given this country. But if you were to make the argument that 100% were admitted via uh, affirmative action, that's 15% of the entire population versus 43% of the people that are there, the white people that are there, did not get there based on their own merit did not get there based on their grade point averages, did not get there based on their own personal intelligence. They got there because their mama, their daddy, their granddaddy, their grandmama, somebody in their family line went there. So if we wanna talk about unfair at admission to Harvard University, we need to look no further than the white population. Well, absolutely. Uh, and, and the thing that just that always cracks me up, Lauren, uh, is a lot of these white folks, they automatically assume that, oh, you got in because of affirmative action. Uh, and, and they always just uh, operate as if they have impeccable credentials. Uh, that may, re Remember uh, when you had uh, the girl, I forgot, Sarah, Mary, whatever the hell her name was, the Fisher girl, yeah. uh, who sued the University of Texas. She was mad uh, because she blamed the black Latino folk as the reason she couldn't get in. Well, when they actually pulled the research, they showed it was a whole bunch of white folks uh, who had lower test scores than her who got in, but they did more <laughs> stuff than just take a test. And again, this is what this is what they do. They see us and they automatically assume, yeah, you, you're only in here because you played ball. Well, yeah, the entire construct is you can't be smarter than we are. And yep. you remember Donald Trump was, uh, you know, trying to in some way insinuate that Barack Obama's uh, Harvard degree was not legit, which, of course, was all a bunch of nonsense. And then meanwhile, him, his son-in-law, they're all legacy. They got in because they, you know, their last name, just to, to Avis's point. Uh, Abe Jones was, was real chill there, real chill. I, I, my energy is the Robert Reeves guy that got up and interrupted Neely, right? He, Reeves gets up and interrupts Neely and wants to go off, and everybody tells him to calm down. I actually think that with these things, we shouldn't calm down. You know, Donald Trump has made it fashionable again to be openly racist. Uh, Donald Trump has made it fashionable again to say things are outrageous right in front of everybody. And that is part of what this is from. And I think the other part of it is just that uh, Rep Neely is just a dumb dumb. You know, I don't think there's anything much deeper than that, other than the obvious, you know, idea in everybody's head, you know, that, that does these types of things that you can't possibly be better than me and you can't possibly be smarter than I am. And so there must be some other reason as to why you're here and you went to Harvard. Of course, that sticks in his craw that this guy went to Harvard. Why did this even come up in, in the first place? But you were right, Roland, to tell him, to tell Rep. Jones, he doesn't have to explain himself. You know, you don't have to explain yourself to these people. They want you, you know, in this sort of defensive posture of having to explain your credentials. You don't have to explain anything. That's all a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, and, and, and the thing here, Greg, I mean, this happens in so many areas. And then what happens is, uh, for a lot of us, uh, I, I, this is where the phrase imposter syndrome comes in, where, <laughs> where, 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 where we feel a need uh, to, again, uh, uh, explain. I, 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 one of the best examples ever, um, oh, my God, he's an attorney uh, out, uh, of, uh, out of Chicago. Why is his name escaping me right now? Uh, and, oh, my goodness. So he's, so my man is about 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. I played golf with him. I can't believe my, his name escaped me. I'm going to remember it in a second. So uh, he gets on a plane. He's in first class. And so a uh, white guy sees him. Uh, and uh, Peter, uh, Peter Bino, Peter Bino, a uh, white guy sees him. And he goes, well, you're not tall enough to play basketball. You're not big enough to play football, so how are you in first class? 
Oh, my God. Now, mind you, Peter is like a $2,000 an hour attorney. <laughs> Peter was one of the minority investors uh, in the Denver Nuggets um, uh, a couple decades ago. Peter, without missing the beat, Greg, says, I'm the biggest drug dealer in Chicago. <laughs> Pulls out his Wall Street Journal, pops it, crosses his leg, and starts reading it. And the dude is sitting there, face is frozen, and Peter mm -hmm. didn't say nothing for the rest of the flight. Peter was not a... Bruh, that's one of the best stories I've ever heard. <laughs> like, like, okay, so you wonder why I'm sitting in the first class? I'm about to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> that, uh, that's the brother, if memory serves me correctly. I haven't heard that name in years, Roland. That's the cat that wear the bow ties. He used to wear the bow ties a lot, I yep. think. Yep. He was on, yeah. Um, the only better response to that would have been to ignore him. I, I think Asa Hilliard did, did, said this years ago, he said a little boy was called into the principal's office after he had scored a perfect score on a test. And the principal asked him, the white principal asked this little black boy, you know, they say you're a genius. What, what makes you think you're a genius? And little boy said, well, maybe the fact that it never occurred to me that I would ever answer a question like that. You see, the problem we see here is not Jeff McNeely. It's Abraham Jones. <laughs> Brother, you don't have, as you try to tell this man, you don't have to explain anything to him. But let's, let's just spend 60 seconds on Jeff McNeely. Jeff McNeely, who's the president and owner of uh, a feed company, uh, G&M Milling Company, founded in 1957, seven years before he was born. Uh, Jeff McNeely, a 1964 graduate, I'm sorry, 1986 graduate of North Carolina State. His only degree, by the way, because after that, he went into the family business. See, we, uh, Avis is right, Doc, you're right. We're going to talk about affirmative action, just five minutes, because they're getting ready to get rid of affirmative action in the next couple of weeks. The Harvard case, they're going to get rid of it there in, in North Carolina. But let's talk about what the real affirmative action is in this country, which is whiteness. Jeff McNeely. Jeff McNeely, who after running the family business that he inherited, there looking silly in his Pee Wee Herman getup. Jeff McNeely, who uh, then was put on the county planning board, served for four years there in the county he represents, then ran for county commissioner and lost. So what happened? They eased him back on the county board for 12 more years. Then he ran for county commissioner finally and won in 2016. Jeff McNeely, who's in the legislature in North Carolina because the governor appointed him to replace a retiring legislature, a legislator in 2019. Jeff McNeely is the face of affirmative action. You know what affirmative action is in this country? You said it, Davis. Whiteness. This man... When he asked that question, I would have completely ignored him. But here's where we come down to the real problem. Maybe the Supreme Court will endorse this independent state legislature of business coming out of North Carolina, the Moore versus Harbor case. Maybe they won't. Now that they flipped it, thanks to this traitorous Democrat woman who then, who was, who's running as a stealth Republican, comes in and flips the legislature. But the point is this. Brother, you can't make them like you. You can't answer a question. You can't be cordial. You can't be gracious. These white boys playing for keeps. You need to run over Jeff McNeely with both tires. This is this man is an absolute product of affirmative action and his inherited business with his son now running it, by the way, as vice president, inherited his political seat that he finally won after losing, keeping him parked at the county commission till he could run again. He is the living definition of affirmative action. And unless you're going to say that to him, the best thing you could have done, brother, is like that little boy with the principal just kept your mouth shut. I mean, look, I, I get the whole idea of, this is what these lawmakers, they, I, I, they, they kill me with, with the whole collegial and, you know, we get along and, you know, the gentle one, the gentleman, the gentle lady uh, and all of that. See, that ain't me. My Come ass on. petty. <laughs> I'm petty. I'm, I'm just letting you know. Uh, I'm petty. Because, see, I would have used my time to ask that clown looking ass fool, uh, pull the video of this, this suit he got on. I, I, I would have I, I straight up, no hose barred, lit his ass up. I would I would have said, Representative, um, would you mind pulling out your high school transcript? I, I literally would have said, uh, are, are you sad and offended that you didn't have the credentials to get into Harvard, that you had no choice. 
And then I would have said, you know, I find it interesting that you Republicans love to complain about elite universities, but you're wondering how I got into Harvard. I would have been petty. I'm just letting y'all know. Roe would have been real petty. <laughs> just like I was petty at Texas A&M when we had a speech communications class and uh, my topic was affirmative action and I got real petty with the class. And I had some white classmates, white boys and white girls who did not agree with it. And I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, to the students in the class, how many of your mothers own businesses? So hands went up. <laughs> and I said, um, I I'm curious, how many of your mothers have contracts with school district, the city, the county, the state, uh, and I went, hands went up. I said, well, congratulations. All of you are having your tuition paid by affirmative action. <laughs> I said, because the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action, white women. Mm -hmm. Then they all froze. They were like, I, I, no, 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 no. I said, facts are facts. I said, now you might want to thank black people because the reality is, um, I said, your white races from Virginia, they thought that they could kill the 64 Civil Rights Act by putting women into it, but that actually got them more votes. I said, so it's really because of black people that your mama got those contracts uh, because we're the ones who actually fought forward because it was President Lyndon Baines Johnson who gave the speech at Howard University uh, where he talked about taking affirmative action uh, and said that's where it started. It wasn't with Richard Nixon. Of course, it was Arthur Fletcher who came in on the Nixon administration and moved it forward. I said, so all of y'all who are sitting in this class whose mamas have, have governmental contracts, you should be thanking black people because affirmative action is how your mamas got their money. That's how petty I got. And this is how we... See, again... I am not, I ain't explaining, justifying nothing to nobody. I ain't, I ain't justifying nothing to black people. I damn sure ain't gonna justify nothing to anybody white. You're not gonna sit here and question, how did I achieve this? How do I achieve that? I mean, I'm, I'm just not going, going to do it. And you're not going to also um, think that you can talk to me in a language that I understand. Last point before I go to the break. So the previous house I lived in, 10,000 square foot, four and a half acres. Uh, and so uh, we move in, got my six nieces there in the driveway, uh, you know, shooting baskets and everything like that. So a white guy next door decides to come by and be neighborly. And let me be real clear with y'all. I don't like neighbors. I don't want to talk. I see people and talk to people every day. I don't want to talk to nobody when I get home. I just really don't. Some of y'all may like neighbors, I don't want to see nobody. That's why it was four and a half acres. I wish the damn thing was five acres with a big ass fence. I don't want to see nobody. So he just moseyed his ass over and he decides to sit here and uh, he's talking and he's talking. And I'm sitting here like, why is he talking to me? And so then one of my nieces walks over and says, hi, I'm so-and-so. I look at her like, did nobody ask your last come here and get your name? I'm like, go back. So all of a sudden at one point then he goes, he starts describing, now, now mind y'all, first of all, there were multiple million dollar houses in this area. The house was a million dollars, it was a million too. This fool goes, yeah, this is a nice hood. Mm. Now I was tolerating his ass. If y'all don't know me, and my family, staff could attest to this, when I'm through with your ass, You don't even exist. You could be standing here shouting, you don't exist to me. That's how mm -hmm. petty I got with homeboy. At some <laughs> point, we are going to understand when you're dealing with bigots, you're dealing with people who think that's how they're going to talk to you, you don't give them any of your energy. You actually make them feel so small by either cussing them out, ignoring them, or making them feel real petty. That dude in North Carolina, absolutely, uh, was a bigot with his statement. And he would have got all of my pettiness. I'm just saying. All right, folks, back to our Roadmark Unfiltered video in just one moment. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things 
that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 